Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this Vishu Farm hosted webinar. My name is Lars Peterson and we're proud to present today's speaker, Pro Professor Matthias Ox, Chair at Institute of Functional and Applied Anatomy, Hanover Medical School in Germany. Professor Ox will speak on assessing lung structure by stereology, part two on what and when uh, on applications. Um, so Professor Ox is an expert in the use of stereological principles used for the assessment of lung microstructure. Dr. Ox, together with Drs. Uh, Shah, Hyde and Weibel, wrote a, a, a white paper commissioned by the American Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society, establishing standards for microscopic characterization of the lung. Um, the first webinar on this topic was given in January uh, 2012, 2012 uh, covering the uh, introduction and basic principles of stereology and for those uh, who missed the first webinar or wish to review it, it was recorded and available for streaming at the Vishufam website. You can go to the uh, resource center of our website and choose uh, webinar uh, stereology and scroll down eight or nine webinars. Uh, there's a long list of, of excellent webinars there. Um, the uh, second um, uh, webinar that we are uh, having today here uh, will focus on examples um, of applications to lung animal models of lung disease and acute lung injury, fibrosis, emphysema and uh, practical aspects such as uh, equipment. Now, during the presentation, you're welcome to submit questions in the questions dialog box in the panel um, uh, to the right. Uh, hand of your screen. Um, I will collect your questions and uh, relay them to Professor Ox after the uh, presentation. So um, I'll leave the word to Professor Ox. So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome all of you to this webinar from wherever you are listening to us and thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to Lars for the kind introduction. Um, he already explained to you that uh, this webinar is actually the second part of a series of two webinars. The first part that was held earlier uh, covering the general principles of stereology and today part two where we focus on applications of stereology to animal models of lung disease. To make sure that we are all on the same page, I will use the first few minutes to repeat only the main points of this first webinar. Um, where I explained that when we want to measure lung structure, we usually do this in order to be able to make statistically valid comparisons. For example, because we want to establish structure-function relationships or because we want to compare different experimental groups. The quantitative parameters that we want to obtain have a certain dimension. Um, for example, they may be uh, related to volume, which is three-dimensional, or to surface area, which is two-dimensional, or to length, which is one-dimensional, and finally to number of particles, which is zero-dimensional. And you can think of any structure in the lung, any, any compartment in the lung that you can uh, then quantitate in terms of its volume or surface area or length or number that is related to developmental aspects or to disease aspects and, and that is related to the changes you want to detect. Derived from these parameters, volume, surface area, length and number, we can also obtain further parameters like mean particle size. Mean particle size is basically volume divided by number and therefore again is a three-dimensional parameter like volume. Um, the other parameter we can derive, for example, is mean barrier thickness that has great functional relevance in the lung mean barrier thickness is basically volume divided by surface area and that is then a one-dimensional parameter again, length. So we always have to keep in mind the parameter has a certain dimension, three-dimensional, two-dimensional, one-dimensional or zero-dimensional and even those that are derived have a certain dimension, three-dimensional or one-dimensional. The methods that we use to obtain these data should fulfill certain requirements. One requirement, of course, is we, we should get real data. Real data means that they are total values that are related to a well-defined and biologically meaningful reference space. In our case, usually we like to have data that express whatever uh, numbers we obtain per lung. So we want to know what's going on in the whole lung. The parameters or the, the data that we obtain should be 
free of any bias. So we do not want to work with data that have a systematic error. And unbiasedness is also uh, expressed as accuracy. So we want to have valid or accurate data, meaning that uh, there is no systematic deviation from the true value. What we also would like to have is, of course, uh, sufficient precision of our data, meaning that for the workload invested, we want to have data that when we do independent repetitions, they are close together and don't show a variance that is too high in the context of the biological study that we do. And finally, of course, the parameters should be, or the methods should be simple enough that we understand what we are doing and transparent enough so that everybody else is also understanding what we have done in order to obtain our quantitative parameters. So the method of choice to obtain quantitative or morphometric data in microscopy is stereology. Stereology can not only be applied to microscopy but basically to every kind of imaging data set you can think of and it can be for practical purposes defined as the science of sampling structures with geometric probes. So that means we have a sampling step involved and we have a measurement step involved where the measurement is done with geometric probes or geometric test systems. And these two steps solve the two problems that we usually have to face whenever we want to quantitate something in microscopy and that is the fact that we have a reduction in size. So we cannot look at everything we have to sample and we have a reduction in dimension because we look at nearly two-dimensional microscopic sections although we are interested in the real three-dimensional structure and this is exactly what stereology can solve. So basically stereology is a sampling theory but also the practice of unbiased sampling and we start with a well-defined reference base as I have already pointed out and in almost all cases when it is possible in experimental studies we would like to have the total lung volume as our reference base so we have to estimate that first. It's the starting point for the analysis and also the end point, end point for the reporting of the data. The samples then have to be randomized so that each part of the lung or each location of the lung has the same chance for being selected for analysis. So we, we need to apply unbiased sampling principles with respect to the randomization of the position of our samples within the lung. At the microscope, finally, we have to think of what is the appropriate test system or the appropriate geometric probe that we can use and that depends on the parameter that we want to estimate. So the fundamental relationship that is shown here tells us that the dimension of the parameter that we want to estimate plus the dimension of the test system that we can use to estimate that parameter has to equal at least three. So for the three-dimensional parameter volume we can use a set of zero-dimensional test points, so points feel volume. For the two-dimensional parameter surface area, we can use a set of one-dimensional test lines, so lines feel surface. For the one-dimensional parameter length, we can use a set of two-dimensional test planes, so planes feel length. And finally, the zero-dimensional parameter number does require the use of three-dimensional test systems or test volumes that are created in microscopy, for example, by the use of two physical sections from one tissue block, a method that has been termed the dissector principle. So the dissectors or test volumes feel number. So to summarize the principles of stereology in microscopy, we first need to make sure what is the parameter that we want to estimate. Is it volume or surface area or length or number? How does this appear on a microscopic section because we lose one dimension? What is the appropriate test system or geometric probe that we can use on the sections to obtain the parameters in 3D? Test points, test lines, test planes or dissectors as test volumes. What is the counting event that is created by the interaction of the test system with uh, the structure on the microscopic section? So it's a test point that hits the area or a test line that intersects the boundary or a test plane that hits the longitudinal feature or a dissector or test volume that contains and therefore hits the top of a particle that appears in this dissector. So we have very simple measurements. We count test points or we 
count intersections or we count transects or we count tops, the appearance of particles in a dissector. And this is input into very simple formulae that give us volume densities or surface densities or length densities or numerical densities. And these densities then in a final step need to be converted to total values because we are not want to finish with densities, we want to have data per lung. And for that we have to multiply the densities by the volume of the reference space and this is why it is so important to estimate the total lung volume before we section the lung in any aspect because by multiplying the densities by the volume of the reference space we can then obtain total volumes, total surface areas, total lengths or total numbers. So that's in a very short uh, ride the, the basics that we can now start to apply to specific uh, models in experimental lung research. And I picked three examples, the first one being acute lung injury, the second one being fibrosis and finally then emphysema. And this last example, emphysema, I would also like to illustrate with a work example. So let's start with acute lung injury. From a structural point of view, acute lung injury is characterized by the formation of edema in the lung, by alterations of the blood-air barrier between alveolar air spaces and capillaries in alveolar septal walls and finally by alterations of the intra-alveolar and the intracellular surfactant compartment. Since we can only quantitate what has been appropriately preserved for microscopy, we have to choose the right fixation strategy and for acute lung injury that means we can only assess intra-alveolar structures like intra-alveolar surfactant or intra-alveolar edema fluid if we fix the lung by the appropriate route of fixation and that is from behind by the vasculature. So acute lung injury models do require vascular perfusion fixation for stereological assessment. And moreover, the assessment of the fine details of blood air barrier alterations and the different subtypes of intraovular surfactant do require analysis by electron microscopy. So we have to have this in mind when we uh, start talking about the fixation and uh, processing strategy. So here is a list of useful parameters that we can uh, apply to assess acute lung injury, in particular to assess edema and its total volume and the volume of edema in different subcompartments, for assessing the blood air barrier, its thickness but also its degree of damage and for assessing intraalveolar and intracellular surfactant uh, compartments. So regarding edema assessment, stereology can distinguish between different compartments in the lung. The peribronchovascular compartment, the alveolar septal compartment and the intraalveolar compartment. And so the nice thing about this structural approach is that we are not only learning about the total amount of edema fluid in the lung, but we also learn something about its distribution in the different compartments of the lung. And since this is basically expressed as volumes, it's simple point counting that is needed for assessing these parameters. The blood air barrier is a major target in acute lung injury and by counting intersections we can estimate the relative surface fractions of the alveolar epithelium as well as the capillary endothelium and different degrees of preservation. Uh, for example, the fraction of normal epithelium or swollen epithelium or fragmented epithelium. As you can see here, we have swellings and fragmentations as typical signs of acute lung injury. And the same can be done on the other side of the blood air barrier on the capillary endothelial side. The mean thickness of the blood air barrier can be derived from existing data because it's basically two times the volume to surface area uh, uh, ratio from the alveolar septal tissue and its surface. Intraalveolar surfactant alterations can also be assessed and the interesting thing here is that the several intraalveolar surfactant subtypes that exist and that can be distinguished morphologically by electron microscopy correspond to different stages in surfactant metabolism. So after secretion of surfactant by alveolar type 2 cells, we find active intraalveolar surfactant forms basically as freshly secreted lamella bodies and in particular as tubular myelin figures as shown here. 
The inactive or spent surfactant material is mainly present as unilamellar vesicles that are then usually taken up by alveolar epithelial type 2 cells, the producers of surfactant. So we can assess surfactant alterations um, based on these principles by simple point counting again to estimate the volume, fractions and the total volumes of active and inactive surfactant compartments in the lung. So we applied these principles in a red lung model of ischemia reperfusion injury, which is a particular type of acute lung injury related to lung transplantation. And we quantified the degree of intraalveolar edema in that case, which uh, obviously was very significant uh, in these lungs and correlated very well with um, lung function. We also assessed intraalveolar surfactant composition. And I only picked two parameters here, tubular myelin, for active surfactant subtypes and unilamellar vesicles for inactive surfactant subtypes. And as you can see, compared to the control group, there is a decrease in uh, the active and an increase in the, intra, uh, in the inactive intraalveolar surfactant form. And this occurs both in regions that are uh, subject to intraalveolar edema formation, as you can see here, but also in regions which do not contain any intraalveolar edema, we find these alterations. And that allows us the conclusion that these surfactant alterations are not only caused by edema formation, but occur obviously at least in part independently from these edema formations. We then tested the effect of exogenous surfactant therapy at different time points in this ischemia reperfusion injury model. So we looked at surfactant therapy before harvest of the lung or at the end of ischemic storage of the lung or during reperfusion of the lung and compare this to a group that did not receive any surfactant therapy. And as you can see here, when, intra, uh, when surfactant, exogenous surfactant is given early, like in group 1, we see uh, the best functional preservation uh, of the lung, but we also see the least amount of edema. We see a better preservation of the integrity of the uh, blood-air barrier with less uh, fragmentations. And we also see the best preservation of the intraalveolar surfactant compartment, which also again correlates well with uh, functional measurements. So, stereology is able to characterize acute lung injury uh, in experimental models to show treatment effects uh, and the benefit of treatment effects that are functionally relevant. So as a second example, let's have a look at how fibrosis can be assessed in animal models. Again, from a structural point of view, we first need to make sure how is fibrosis as a disease characterized. It is characterized by the presence of fibrotic foci. These foci do no longer participate in gas exchange, so we can also uh, express this as destroyed or destructed uh, parenchyma. Then we have a thickening of alveolar septal walls, and we have a thickening of the blood-air barrier which is part of the alveolar wall, separating the alveolar air spaces from the capillaries in these septal walls. So here is a flow chart that shows, again, useful parameters for the assessment of fibrosis. And they include that once we have the total lung volume and we know the volume fraction of parenchyma in that lung, we can have a look at uh, the fraction of destroyed parenchyma that contain fibroblastic foci that are no longer um, therefore participating in gas exchange. Um, we also, in particular, look at the uh, blood-air barrier. And the blood-air barrier, again, requires electron microscopy to be able to distinguish between the epithelial side and the endothelial side and the interstitium in between. But then we can look at the thickness of this blood-air barrier and its particular composition at the EM level. So this is an approach that we applied to a bleomycin-induced injury model in rats. And um, here we see the effect of bleomycin in these rats without further treatment. And here we see a group that also received bleomycin uh, to induce injury. But uh, this group expressed hepatocyte growth factor 
um, by the alveolar epithelial type 2 cells under a type 2 cell specific uh, promoter, surfactant protein C promoter. And if we compare the data of the bleomycin group without HGF and the bleomycin group that received or expressed HGF, we do see differences in the stereological data. So we have less alveolar septal tissue and more alveolar airspace in the treatment group. We have thinner septal walls and the septal walls are not only thinner but it's in particular the blood air barrier that is thinner and within the blood air barrier and its components, epithelium, endothelium and interstitium, it's in particular the interstitial compartment that is thinner under the expression of hepatocyte growth factor. So again, stereology can show statistically significant treatment effects in experimental groups. And now we come to the most common application of stereology in experimental lung research and that is the assessment of emphysema. According to the official definition of the American Thoracic Society, emphysema is defined by its structural alterations as an abnormal permanent enlargement of the air spaces distal to the terminal bronchiole and accompanied by destruction of the walls. This can indeed be quantified histologically. And most researchers do this and do it in mouse models that are now the most popular animal models of emphysema. The question, however, we should ask is how well are these models really characterized and how should they actually be characterized? Two years ago, we published an official ATS ERS research policy statement on standards for quantitative assessment of lung structure. And Lars has mentioned this to you in his introduction. Currently, we are working on a follow-up that should provide practical guidelines and recommendations for one specific application, and that is quantitative assessment of emphysema in mice. We picked this example because it's the most common one, but not only the most common one, but it's also the one where we see most problems uh, in the field where, where people are not using the appropriate methodology. So again, what are the structural characteristics of lung emphysema that we can quantitate by stereology? According to the definition, it's basically a loss of alveolar epithelial surface. And that loss of epithelial surface is of course always accompanied by a loss of alveoli and an enlargement of the remaining alveoli. So these are the major parameters that we should focus on. But what is common practice? Common practice is this parameter here that is used by most people in the field. It's called mean linear intercept length or sometimes also mean chord length or as its abbreviation LM. Um, I would consider mean linear intercept length probably as the black sheep of lung morphometry uh, because the interpretation is extremely tricky with this parameter. So let's first define what intercept means. An intercept is a distance between two intersections, for example two intersections with alveolar walls. So if we look at the set of test lines here over a lung micrograph, you see the test lines do intersect the alveolar septal walls here for example and here. And between these two intersections this distance is an intercept length. And if we count enough intercept lengths and then take the mean, we basically obtain this parameter. The pro one of the problems is related to the fact that we count uh, or we measure distances between two intersections of alveolar walls and that means the intercepts include not only alveoli but also alveolar ducts as you can see here. So sometimes an intercept only refers to one alveolus, but here as you can see it is one alveolus and an alveolar duct and another alveolus. So the intercepts always include alveolar ducts and they do not distinguish between alveoli and alveolar ducts. That's one particular point to remember. When it was introduced as a parameter, it was originally used as a tool to estimate alveolar surface area. So alveolar surface area in the beginnings of lung stereology uh, were estimated indirectly by this relationship telling you that the surface area of alveolar is equal to four times 
the volume, the total volume of the uh, parenchyma divided by mean linear intercept length. In other words, the more intercepts you count, the more surface you have, basically. So, in that sense, um, the important point here is that the measurement of emphysema is nowadays almost always restricted to only a single measure uh, of alveolar size given by mean linear intercept length. And I put alveolar size in quotation marks. So it's very important people report mean linear intercept values as alveolar size measurements in mouse models of emphysema for example and this is not possible because we have several problems with this parameter. One problem, or some problems are related to the automated analysis because people tend to do it automatically, not by manual stereological counts. If you do an automated analysis of mean linear intercept length, you have what is called edge effects. Edge effects mean that some of the test lines, of course, produce intersects that are not closed because they extend to the artificial edges of the fields of view. So what should we do with these intercepts? We cannot measure them because we do not see where the next intersection is. So the only thing we can do is we disregard them. But as soon as we disregard them, the problem of course is that um, these tend to produce a bias towards larger measurements because the larger the intercept, the higher the probability for being cut by the artificial edge and therefore not being included in the measurement. So we have a bias by the edge effects. We also see false measurements in automated analysis. False measurements could, of course, either be produced by an intercept that is measured by an automated system like here, that is not an alveolar intercept, but this is actually an intercept in a blood vessel. So systems cannot distinguish between the lumen of a blood vessel and the lumen of an alveolus and each count is then going into the final calculations and that again of course produces bias. Another source of bias would be if we had let's say an alveolar macrophage somewhere here in the middle uh, of an alveolar lumen then of course one long intercept would be artificially divided into two shorter intercepts again producing bias. So automated analysis is certainly not recommended. So even if we had done everything properly and we would have an unbiased estimate of mean linear intercept, we still have problems with the interpretation. We have problems with the interpretation for a very simple reason. This relationship here, the relationship between surface area, parenchymal volume and mean linear intercept tells you that if you have an increase in mean linear intercept length, but also at the same time an increase in total lung volume and therefore in parenchymal volume. Basically, if this is an increase, let's say, to the same degree, it tells you that the surface area is unchanged. So what we have here is what stereologists call the reference trap. The problem with this parameter, mean linear intercept, is that it critically depends on lung volume and any change in lung volume influences the measurement of mean linear intercept. To demonstrate the problems with mean linear intercept as a parameter, we compared two case studies. We looked at true destructive emphysema in a mouse model, and these were uh, mice deficient in surfactant protein D that do develop emphysema, and compared this to rabbits, fully normal rabbits without any pathology that were simply fixed at different levels of inflation by vascular um, perfusion. And as you can see, we see an increase in mean linear intercept length in the true emphysema model and also in the distribution. We also see an increase in mean linear intercept if we fix at a different degree of lung inflation in normal rabbits and the same shift in the distribution. So the changes are comparable and therefore what does the parameter mean linear intercept actually prove? Obviously not emphysema because the same effect can happen without any emphysema. So to summarize uh, this parameter, mean linear intercept, it has some advantages but many major disadvantages. One advantage is it measures the free diffusion distance in SNA airways. So it's a wall-to-wall -wall distance in the complex comprising alveolar and alveolar ducts. And this is, a, if you want to correlate, to a parameter that is uh, used in MRI studies where people define the apparent diffusion coefficient when they use hyperpolarized gases, for example. 
and see increases in this parameter under certain uh, pathological conditions. And of course, one advantage, if you want, is it, it seems to be so simple. But the disadvantages, I think, are more severe. Um, as you can see, it's very often not estimated correctly if people use automated analysis, uh, so they, they ignore edge effects and false measurements that introduce bias. In general, mean linear intercept is not a measure of alveolar size uh, because it does comprise alveolar and ducts and does not distinguish between them. And there is also a shape problem involved that I did not uh, go into detail. The parameter critically depends on total lung volume, so it's subject to the reference trap or to the degree of lung inflation or the differences in elastic properties in different experimental groups, for example. And if we uh, compare then, for example, a tissue that has been embedded in paraffin and therefore has been subject to um, shrinkage in paraffin, the different elastic properties may lead to differences in uh, the shrinkage degree also. In general, mean linear intercept cannot differentiate between hyperinflation of a lung or really destructive emphysema. So it will never be able to prove emphysema. And the point also is that we do have better alternatives at hand uh, provided by simple stereological method. So uh, in general there is, I think, basically no excuse to use uh, mean linear intercept length as a single measurement in emphysema studies. So let's have a look at these alternatives that are available in stereology. Um, by point counting, we can look at volumes. By intersection counting, we can look at surface areas. And by dissector counts, we can look at particle number. And therefore, we have everything we need. We can look at uh, the volume of uh, parenchymal airspace. And we can divide the volume of parenchymal airspace into alveolar airspace and alveolar duct airspace. And this will tell us something about the increase of airspaces in general. We can look at the volume of uh, parenchymal tissue or alveolar septal tissue, and this will tell us something about the loss of tissue in emphysema. Alveolar surface area is, from a functional point of view, uh, the most important parameter in emphysema research. So it's the loss of surface area that is most relevant in these cases. From a mechanistic point of view, it may be important to know how this decrease in surface area is actually happening. And for that, we could also assess the number of alveoli to really prove loss of functional units, if you want, and uh, the increase in mean alveolar size. That tells us something about the enlargement of the remaining alveoli. By combining two volume estimates, the volume and the number weighted mean volume, we are also able to assess the heterogeneity of alveolar size because sometimes it's not the mean that is most important, but sometimes it's the size distribution that is most important. And that's also possible. So for volume and surface estimation in emphysema research, we only have to do simple point and intersection counting. So uh, we have Always to start, of course, with estimating the total volume of the lung, for example, by the Archimedes principle. So we weigh the displaced fluid if we immerse the lung into fluid. And then by point counting, we can assess the uh, fraction of parenchyma within the lung and the fraction of alveolar airspace, alveolar duct airspace, and septal tissue within the parenchyma. And by multiplying this, we can also obtain total volumes. And the same we can do by intersection counting uh, of test lines with the alveolar epithelial surface area, then we can uh, estimate surface area. For alveolar number estimation, we need to apply the dissector. And the counting event is the alveolar opening. It's present in one dissector section, but not in the other one. We refer to this at the bridge count. So we count the bridges as openings in uh, a network of openings. And this gives us uh, an estimate of the number of alveoli in the lung. And the total volume of alveolar airspace divided by the total number of alveoli then uh, allows us to derive mean alveolar size. So here's our application of these uh, methods in uh, mice that are deficient uh, of surfactant protein D. These SPD deficient mice do develop normally after birth, but then they develop spontaneous emphysema. 
And we can assess this by looking at the decrease in surface area and the decrease in alveolar number and the increase in mean alveolar size. In addition, these SPD deficient mice also have hypoplasia and hypertrophy of the surfactant producing alveolar epithelial type 2 cells. And also an increase in the intracellular amount of surfactant, which is stored in specific organelles, termed lamellar bodies and we have an increase in their number per type 2 cell. So this is the phenotype characterization. And then again we can have a look at a treatment uh, approach and see whether this treatment does result in an improvement of the emphysematous phenotype. And here we investigated uh, a recombinant fragment of human SPD and whether uh, the treatment of these SPD deficient mice in any way can uh, prevent the development of the alterations. So here's the fragment that was given and we have an untreated SPD deficient group as a negative control and a wild type group that was also not treated as a positive control and three treatment groups treated for three weeks or six weeks or nine weeks beginning at the age of nine or six or three weeks and then we compared the data at the age of 12 weeks. And here's the stereological data again. And as you can see, three weeks of treatment with a recombinant fragment of human SPD are already sufficient to show that the loss of surface area, the loss of alveoli and the uh, enlargement of the remaining alveoli can be prevented. After six weeks of treatment we can also prevent the alterations at the level of alveolar epithelial type 2 cells, the number and size, and at the level of their intracellular storage organelles, the lamellar bodies. So we do have methods, stereological principles and applied by these parameters that allow us to, to make valid conclusions regarding emphysema models and treatment uh, approaches in these models. So the basic recommendations for emphysema assessment in mice are that of course you have to fix properly, sample properly, process properly and embed properly. You have to have in mind that mean linear intercept length has severe limitations, so we definitely do not recommend this parameter as the single parameter for emphysema assessment. What we do recommend is a two-step approach. So if you want, there is a basic level on single sections. Starting with total lung volume, you should estimate the total volume of parenchymal air um, divided in alveolar and alveolar duct air and parenchymal tissue. And uh, in particular, alveolar surface area. And then we have a second or advanced level which includes dissector analysis for estimation of alveolar number and mean alveolar size and uh, then you can even uh, obtain information about heterogeneity of alveolar sizes. So at the end I would like to illustrate how these data are obtained in practice by going through one worked example with one particular mouse from a study uh, we have published a few years ago. It was a collaboration with uh, a group in Cambridge and so the mice were fixed in Cambridge. It's the SPD deficient mouse model uh, that was treated with a recombinant fragment of human SPD. The fixed lungs were stored in fixative and sent to us and then we took care of the uh, further processing and what we first did of course is we estimated total lung volume in that case by the Archimedes principle or fluid displacement based on buoyancy so this is the first uh, data that is essential and after that we sampled tissue blocks for light and electron microscopy and for light microscopy these blocks were embedded in glycomethacrylate to prevent the shrinkage that is associated with paraffin so what do we need then at the microscope to do the actual measurements. Well at a basic level we do not need much. We need micrographs that should be properly sampled, again giving each part of the section an equal chance for being selected. And usually these days of course we have digital micrographs. And then we have to apply test systems to these micrographs and the test systems need to contain those probes that are appropriate for the parameter. So for example sets of test points, but also sets of test lines and as you can see here different examples that do contain points as well as lines or at least line segments. So there's not much you need to get started and with this you can have all the information necessary to obtain stereological data. Um, the test systems themselves also contain some information that you need to uh, 
No, in order to be able to do the computations, for example, the area that is associated with each test point or the test line length that is associated with each test point or the area of the counting frame. And these are input into at least some of these formula for uh, surface area length measurements and sometimes also for volume measurements. Can we improve the efficiency? Because this sounds probably very time consuming to you. And indeed there are a few things available. And this is a micrograph that, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is a photograph that uh, Lars Peterson did a couple of years ago when he visited the Institute of Anatomy in Bern. And this is Ewald Weibel, the pioneer of lung stereology, sitting at one of the very first systems that had a motorized stage for collecting these fields of view and then projecting them onto a screen where you could put the test systems on. Other versions later contained uh, these projection arms where the uh, field of view was then projected to the table and you could use a transparent test system again to do the counts. So this is, if you want, the early days of the advanced way of doing lung stereology. So nowadays we have a new state of the art and that is given by whole slide stereology. So we have a very, if, if we have available a slide scanner as it can be seen here and specific stereology software as can be seen here, which can also be connected to a light microscope of course, but a slide scanner is even more convenient. We have a very simple automated workflow because these uh, systems do the test field selection and the test system generation basically for you and they can also help you with the computing of the data. Um, for certain applications it's even necessary to have the help of uh, computer assisted systems because they can randomize stereological probes in 3D for example or they can also improve the efficiency of the generation of test fields. So this is what I would recommend and here for our worked example we can continue based on these uh, machinery to use simple point counting on four tissue blocks per lung in that case to estimate the volume of parenchyma versus the volume of non-parenchyma. So we use a low magnification, we count test points on parenchyma and test points on non-parenchyma and of course points on structure of interest divided by points on reference space gives us the volume density of the structure within the reference space. So we have 86% parenchyma and 14% non-parenchyma in that lung. Um, at a higher magnification we go to the next level. So within the parenchyma then we want to distinguish between alveolar airspace, alveolar duct airspace and alveolar septal tissue. Again we use point counting and um, we have then at a 20x magnification again the points on septal tissue, the points on alveolar air and the points on alveolar duct air providing us how 100% of parenchyma are distributed into alveolar airspace, alveolar duct airspace and alveolar septal tissue. At the next um, level, but we can use the same magnification actually um, 20 times, we also use test lines to count intersections. And the intersections we count is with um, alveolar surface. And these intersections go into the estimation of the alveolar surface fraction of uh, alveolar surface per parenchyma and then multiplied by the reference space we can obtain the total surface of uh, alveolar epithelium in the lung. Then we also want to know uh, how about septal thickness and we get this for free basically because we can derive this parameter from the data that are already available because alveolar septal thickness is basically two times the volume to surface ratio. So we know the volume of septal tissue, we know the surface of alveolar epithelium and therefore by multiplying this ratio by two, we know the thickness of alveolar septae. Then we want to know alveolar number and what do we have to do? We have to use a dissector. So we section a consecutive row of uh, three sections of 1.5 micron in this case and we use section number one and section number three as a dissector with a height of three micron then and we count the alveolar openings or the bridges that appear in these dissectors. And then again we have the formula, this is the counts per 
volume of a single dissector multiplied by the number of times we have used the dissector in both directions using each section of the dissector once for counting. And so this is basically uh, the formula here and as you can see the numerical density then has to be multiplied again by the volume of the reference space which is the volume of the parenchyma within the lung multiplied by the volume of the lung. So the total number of alveoli in that lung was uh, 6.56 million. And then again we can derive mean alveolar size so we get this parameter for free because we do know the uh, total volume of alveolar airspace and we can divide this by the total number of alveoli and then we obtain mean alveolar size for free. So this is all the parameters that we would report regarding this emphysema model. Total lung volume and how this total lung volume then is distributed over parenchyma and non-parenchyma and this is the distribution of the parenchymal volume into alveolar airspace, alveolar duct airspace and septal tissue. Total surface area, thickness of alveolar septum, alveolar number and mean alveolar size. So let's summarize where and how we can increase efficiency in stereology. We have if we look at the workflow of a stereological uh, analysis, we have the sampling level, so we have to talk about the sampling design and how we process the tissue and how we section the tissue and how much actually, so how many blocks, how many uh, sections. Then we have the level at the microscope where we have to acquire fields of view and where we have to generate uh, the test fields there and uh, do the counts using appropriate uh, probes or test systems and finally the analysis where our counts have to be computed to go into the uh, simple formulae for the estimators and then finally statistics. So what we can do is of course first we have to plan the study wisely. So uh, the principle we should follow uh, has been termed the do more or less well principle by Ewald Weibel. So we have to distribute our manual counts in a smart way, meaning that we should count as much as necessary over well distributed samples but not more. And this is by investing more uh, workload into the higher levels of the sampling hierarchy. So we should use more animals per group and more uh, blocks per animal but we should not count thousands and thousands of points distributed only over a very few number uh, of fields, for example. Then of course we also have smart machines that can make our life easier, so whole slide uh, stereology, the combination of slide scanners and stereology software allow us uh, to automate certain steps in this uh, workflow, for example the acquisition of images, the generation of test fields and uh, the computation at least partly and of course the statistics. So um, this is what we can do to make stereology even more efficient. This was also my summary slide from the first part and I would like to reinforce that stereology has a lot to offer for lung research by providing methods that are free of any bias and that have a high efficiency. So the data we can obtain are very valid, they are reliable, they are real 3D data and you can generalize them and you can compare data from everywhere in the world over time and space. Um, so I think stereology is really essential for a proper quantitative assessment in, in any aspect when we want to characterize lung structure or even ultrastructure at the EM level and to make uh, valid comparisons between groups. A look at the literature of course is recommended and here is a few references I would like to recommend but even better is of course if you really want to start applying stereology in your own project and you haven't done so, um, the best start is I think to attend one of the many stereology courses that are uh, offered all over the world and there's always a list available on the uh, website of the International Society for Stereology. Just last week we finished our annual course in Bern in Switzerland and I would be very happy to welcome at least some of you uh, at one of our next courses. So with this I would like to uh, finish and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you Matthias and um, uh, we have uh, a couple of questions uh, coming in here. Um, so um, one is, is asking uh, is there a commercial source of uh, SPD deficient mice? <laughs> 
Uh, that's an interesting question that is not related to stereology. I am not aware of a commercial source of SPD deficient mice. The ones that we have, uh, we obtained basically from collaborators and uh, they, they were, I mean, they were developed in a, a lab in San Francisco by Sam Horgood. There is another source by, by Jim Fisher and Jeff Whitsett from Cincinnati. Um, so uh, I think in order to uh, get hold of these mice, you should either contact Sam Horgood in San Francisco or Jeff Whitsett in Cincinnati. All right, and there's a second one here. Um, if you're using a fractionator sampling for counting and yeah. superimpose test lines for surface area, do you still have to multiply by the reference volume to get the true value or do you multiply by the sampling fractions instead? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I did not go into the details of, of sampling this time. I think in the first part uh, of the two-part webinar, I talked about different sampling strategies and one very elegant sampling strategy is termed the fractionator. What you do there is basically you keep track of the sampling fraction all along the various stages of the sampling chain. And in the end, you count and then you multiply the counts by the inverse of the sampling fraction. That principle works for number estimation. So the final counts are numbers per fraction. And the number per fraction at the final stage multiplied by the inverse of the sampling fraction is an unbiased estimate of total number and the elegant part here is that this is independent from any type of tissue deformation. So no matter whether there is shrinkage because you have embedded in paraffin, number estimation per fraction multiplied by the inverse of the sampling fraction is unbiased. But this does not hold true for surface area. So if you have a fractionator sampling design, and if you then are interested in surface area estimations, you do have to worry about whether or not there is shrinkage in your tissue. So surface areas are affected by tissue shrinkage, volumes or particle sizes are affected by tissue shrinkage, but not number as long as you count in a fractionator design. So if you do a sampling in a fractionator design, you still have to keep track of the total volume of the reference space. In the final stage, if you want, you can do a surface estimation with test lines, but that gives you then not a surface per fraction, but it gives you the surface per unit volume, and that has to be multiplied by the volume of the reference space. So the unbiasedness of a fractionator estimate does hold true for number, but for all other parameters, it's doable to do this in a fractionator design, but then you have to multiply by the volume of the reference space, and then you have to make sure that there is no tissue deformation uh, due to your processing. All right, thank you, Matthias. I think that was uh, very clear. Um, I don't think we have uh, we don't have more questions uh, at the moment. Um, you you can always uh, send us questions and we can forward them to Matthias. Uh, I just have one one extra comment, and that is that um, um, Matthias just showed you a book for for stereology, uh, which you can which you which is a good place to start. It's a good thing to go to the uh, uh, courses uh, that is, is held. Uh, if you want to um, look at some of the literature, um, on the, if you look at the Visual website, we'll have a collection um, of papers uh, good to start with uh, if you're interested in lung stereology. So uh, you can look at, at references to papers there um, and if you're interested. All right, um, then uh, thank you very much everybody for attending and thank you very much Matthias for, for giving this excellent talk. We will make uh, the recording of this uh, presentation available on our website as well and uh, all of you will receive a, a link uh, to the presentation or to the video when it is um, uh, when it's all um, ready. Um, so thanks again everyone and uh, have a good day.